Hey beer geeks, I'm super excited to say not only am I down at Dea, not only do I have a beer in my hand, but this is my collaboration with Dea Brinko. This is the tank where it is. It's young, I can't drink it yet, but to hold this in my hand is very exciting. And we're gonna sit down and have a chat with Theo and Gareth of Dea about this beer and about how it fits into my new book, A Year in Beer, all about seasonality in brewing. Just over four years ago, I visited a small startup brewery in Cheltenham. I'd had a couple of cans of their flagship, or perhaps back then their, their only beer, Steady Rolling Man, but I'd been really impressed by not only how juicy and how hop forward it was, but also by how light and crisp and sessionable the beer was, because there weren't that many beers in 2017 like that. So I really wanted to meet the team behind this and see the brewery that was producing it mostly because I could see this being the way that hazy beers were going to go. And on my first trip there, I found a beautiful tap room, a decent sized brew house, and a philosophy of building the brewery's brand through one seminal beer rather than a stream of different releases. Inspired by his time in America, founder Theo seemed to know where British beer was going and was quietly ambitious about what he could do with Dea. I think if you're in the British beer scene, you kind of know where that story went. But years later, I started work on this, my new book, A Year in Beer, and I was looking for breweries to help me celebrate the launch of it and brew a beer each that celebrated the seasons. As one of the best IPA brewers pretty much in the world at this point, I thought that they would be a great fit to produce that kind of light, fluffy, really crisp, but incredibly hop forward beer to represent spring. And it also happened to give me a really good excuse to go and see the new site that they moved into in the last year. So as well as making a film about this beautiful beer, Sunny Spells, which we brewed together to celebrate the launch of my book, I also thought it would be a great opportunity to sit down with Theo and the head brewer, Gareth, to see exactly what's happened in the last couple of years and the crazy journey that they've been on as a result of the success of making really crisp, pintable, hazy, New England style beers. So I have to say, I'm absolutely thrilled to see this steel city that you guys have built since I last came in, in I think, early 2018. Yeah. T tell me about this new site, because it's just, just around the corner, but it's huge. Yes, so we moved in here about two years ago. So last time we came was 2018. Mm -hmm. We're in the site over there, about 4,000 square foot. So a lot smaller, a lot more uh, different in terms of brew kit. And here we are. In a, in a much bigger site. Uh, we've got 35,000 square foot, so obviously the, the physical space is a lot bigger, and then the brew kit's a lot bigger. Different tanks, different packaging line, new tap room, and overall just a much bigger operation at the moment. And there's an insane amount of different beers coming out now as well. Like you have di more than new, one new beer a week, quite frequently. Yeah, so I mean, in, uh, in the old place, we had, what, six? We had 10, ten tanks. Here we've got 16 tanks and we've done a lot of work on our process flow as well so we can turn the beers around a bit quicker and we've got, we've got more tanks to play with. So yeah, that definitely helps. I'd say on average at the moment we're releasing sort of four to five different beers a week, but a lot of them are core beers or beers that we bring back. So it's not just completely new stuff the whole time, but there is a lot of new stuff as well. So we try and get the balance between a good amount of core beer so people know exactly what we're about, but then also different stuff to keep people interested. But we probably don't play around as much as we used to over there because we have 40 hectare brew length. There's a bit more inherent risk in that. So we don't completely just muck around. So was this, was this always the plan, this kind of size and this kind of concept? Or were you kind of surprised by the success that you guys had and this sort of came from that? I think we always wanted to get this size and this scale and this, um, this sort of site where it's really, really a great working environment uh, for the staff here and stuff like that. And the brew kit we have now definitely doesn't hold us back. 
So we wanted to get into that sort of position. But to get here as quickly as we did, we didn't really expect, or we didn't know. We just sort of, we're just going at it, really. I mean, I remember when, when we spoke, and I'll flash up some bits of the video of where we were back in 2018, and we talked a lot about the places that you traveled to in America and places that you'd worked and the ambitions that you had and the inspiration that those places were giving you. It feels like you've really come good, good on it. Like, it feels like walking into a well-established American tap room, yeah. brewery tap room now when you walk in, which is unreal, given how quickly that's happened. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the, 100% the goal and like we were very American influenced at the start if you know what I mean so like it was it was kind of like an obvious path for us and then I think what I'd like is that we've created our own sort of aesthetic and our own sort of niche but it's very much feels like that yeah, yeah. and it still has that character of the original tap room right here as yeah. well which yeah like the color schemes the same Fred who did all our woodwork has done all the woodwork here it's just a lot bigger yeah. and so filling that space is a bit different Tom's done some nice artwork there's plenty of trees and plants and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of simple, but um, I think it's our aesthetic and that's the key thing with anything. It's like our branding is us, it represents us. You know, we're not trying to be the same as anyone else. And I think that's the key thing. So if other tap rooms and other brands and stuff like that, I think you really have to own what you're about. And I think people come in here and they realize it's the dare aesthetic and what we've done from the start really. And what, what I loved during that tour that we just had, is, as well as like the hugely impressive sort of steel side of it and the production side of it and the beautiful beers that we're drinking and the unreal beer list, is the, you know, the, the additional touches, stuff like you've got a proper kitchen for your stuff, you've got, you've got you're growing tomatoes in the greenhouses and vegetables out the back, and um, there's a sense of seasonality. Oh, yeah. Literally within this brewery, there's living things within it that are changing oh, yeah. throughout the year. Yeah, yeah, they can see where I'm going, they can see where I'm going. <laughs> Um, so you were one of the brews, so when I, when I was thinking about who would be great to work with uh, to release the four pack um, for seasonality, uh, for the book all about seasonality, I wanted to work with you guys because I think, although IPA is drunk all day, every day by big geeks, there is a strong sense of seasonality in it because it's based on a crop, right, that yeah. comes once a, mm -hmm. once a year. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get to the bit that we come up with, what, what does that make a big difference to how you brew that sort of? one stop shop each year. Yeah, we, I mean, we're always trying to source the, the best raw ingredients, raw materials for our beers as possible. And we're, we're lucky that we've got really good relationship with all of our, for example, all, all of our suppliers, but maybe talking about IPAs, our, our hop suppliers, and they may be not took a punt on us, but you know, they, they took a little bit of a gamble with us when we were on a smaller scale, but we managed to like, we managed to get that relationship built. Well, totally have a bit more sway yeah. about where the hops were coming yeah, from. Yeah. We, so we did selection we did a couple of years ago, which is massive for us. Right, yeah. Yeah. So we had yeah. to commit to pretty big volumes of hops and pretty big, it's not about financial stuff, but, you know, we had to financially commit because yeah. they cost a lot of money. So securing, securing the best hops, not only they're grown the best, they are processed the best and they are stored in top condition. That's, that's really important for the beers. I think, yeah, no, for us, like we've started to, to, to improve those relationships with those hot farms and really start to um, actually have a working relationship with those bases instead of it just being a name on a sheet, Citrus Simcoe, whatever. And we are starting to do, when the hops come in fresh, we'll go into a saturated series and say, this is fresh Idaho 7 or this is fresh Simcoe, whatever it is. And that's really interesting. But the other thing is, is that we do use hops throughout the whole year. There is also two harvests as well. We use a lot of New Zealand and Australia, well, particularly New Zealand, we use some Australian hops, but particularly New Zealand hops, and we contract direct with them. So when they come in in say September, November, we'll make a showcase on those. So we'll do saturated Motueka with Clayton Holtz, for example. So there is a seasonality there on the clean side, and then a massive seasonality on the mixed fern side, which is obviously smaller scale and a bit more niche. But we, we just showed you the mixed fern side, like we're using so many fruits. We're picking some of our own fruits and stuff like that. So, and those beers are going so through different temperatures as they're fermenting yeah, yeah. and all this, because they're in so linked and... towards like seasons with that, in that regard. But yeah, with the hop side, we're trying our best to get the most out of the relationships with the suppliers, but then also the product. And to do that, you need to tune in to the seasonality of the whole thing. There's, there's quite a lot of pressure on breweries to commit to, as I said, to commit to certain volumes. Um, but there's also upstream massive pressure on the farmers and the hop merchants to, because as you said, it's one, well, in each hemisphere, it's once, once a year yeah. harvest time. And that's, a, incredibly intense and hot, um, intense atmosphere and hard work for them to pick all those hops and process them in as quick 
time frame, sorry, in a shorter time frame as possible to also keep the, them in good condition. Also, the perfect time frame for that variety. Exactly. Yeah, because there's this month of hops being ready at certain different times for different varieties. So sometimes it comes down to days, depending yeah. on all the atmospheric conditions that are going on. I'd like to also um, say something about the malt, because that's yes, another that's seasonal ingredient. Yeah. And, uh, Crisp response, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> we um, last uh, season's barley growing conditions were very suboptimal, um, and despite the best efforts of the monsters, we, we've had a bit of a had to dance around a little bit, um, changing mass temperatures, changing certain things on the brew kit to try and maintain the consistency in our beers. And the beer we've brewed with you is one of the first on the new season's malt. And that is, yeah, it's the second week we've been using the new season's malt. And um, yeah, the flavor is back up there and the performance of that malt is back up there. So yeah, I guess that's to, really good. To some extent, when brewers brew well seasonally, the drinkers don't notice because that means that they're adapted with you know keeping those peaks and those troughs as, yeah. as linear as possible because they're understanding yeah. their ingredients and, and the in very very some, some beers you know you're making the whole time so you want to 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 level out any swings and stuff like that and then some beers are one-off beers and you're happy showcasing something that's completely different. Well, I'm super excited to talk about, you know, we're all here, probably in the YouTube title is something like I brewed a beer with Daya. So let's talk about the beer that we, we came together and, and we made. Uh, and it's a West Coast double IPA. You know, it's a yeah. classic spring, spring style, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, my brief to you, like what I wanted to do is to use all those new hops that have come over at the start of this year. Yeah. And often you see sort of a glut of sort of American hops. What, what this year is 2020 harvest beers coming out and you guys cloud water verdant all singing the praises of these new hops because it's a it's an important moment right it's you know what the next year is going to taste like to some extent if you're heavily using simcoe or whatever hop it is yeah, yeah. um and then on top of that like i asked you guys to put some together that would be like sort of rain soaked pine forests and really floral citrusy notes that would sort of talk of the new life of of spring. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the, the hops that you've chosen for that and then we'll dig into the malts as well. So the, um, oh, the malts won't take long. Uh, <laughs> the, the hops that we chose are uh, Chinook, Idaho 7 and Simcoe and leaning more towards Chinook and Simcoe um, being west coast leaning beer. Uh, piney. Chinook's, yeah, Chinook's like classic, brief. pretty piney, a uh, bit pithy, um, not too, hopefully not too much Simcoe's quite out of favour, I think. Oh, sorry, Chinook's quite out of favour in a lot of uh, It has sort of disappeared. Now, but we love yeah. it. So it's it's basically on, on kernel labels, and yeah, that's about yeah, yeah. it now. It's, it's pretty aggressive, but it's, yeah. it's great. Yeah, so you need to maybe exercise a bit of restraint when you use it. Um, and Simcoe is probably joint our favourite hop in mm. the brewery, of, of ones that we regularly use. Mm. Um, it's one of those hops that can also go either way. Like you can, yeah. It can be really lovely and piney. Yeah. It can be really dank and resinous, and it also yeah. can be really quite juicy sometimes yeah. we find the hot you know the simcoe that we selected and, and the simcoe we got last year was like really mangoey and definitely has pine and a bit weird earthy undertone but it's really tropical as well yeah. so that's kind of like the perfect balance for us because you get like that 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 great pine character which you get in a lot of american hops and then there's really nice tropical fruit character as well so that pairs quite well with chinook which is quite razory it's quite sharp yeah, yeah. So simcoe plays nicely with most things i yeah. think with most hops yeah. Um, it does seem to have like a really soft and lovely bit, uh, kind of bitter sweetness to it as well as a hop, which is strange to say about something that's very, very bitter, but it's, it's not aggressive in its citrus kind of quality. And, the, um, and we also put in some Idaho 7, which is quite pineapple-y. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, well, that's very much not traditional for a West Coast IPA or it's double IPA, because it's a new hop exactly, as well. Yeah, so yeah. like West Coast IPA is going to be made with Idaho 7, but it's got citra-like qualities to it, I think. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. And so we'd not used that hop combination before. Yeah. Idiot checking myself. No, we haven't. So, yeah. <laughs> That's exciting as well. See how it will play. Yeah, the chin, like, so, yeah, so we'll have loads of pine, loads of, well, not loads of citrus because you're being careful with the amount of Idaho. Yeah. And then hopefully Simcoe to sort of knit it all together and yeah. precisely give it that West Coasty feel. It's fun for us as well because we haven't done that many West Coast IPAs and it's still like a work in progress. So, like, we're obviously reasonably well known for like soft, juicy styles. Yeah. New England, dare I say, <laughs> and um, so it's really fun to play around and try new stuff and um, make something that's cleaner and leaner and water profile is different as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. I think we're getting better at them as well. It's good. Well, I, I think something I've always loved about the day of beers, and it's also why I thought maybe West Coast would be a better, better fit for this, is because all of your beers do have a Christmas to them and a slight lightness to them that yeah. maybe you don't find in other New England style yeah. brewing and. 
in the UK. So I feel like doing a West Coast yeah. with you guys is going to really give us something really floral and aromatic, but also yeah. I think, crisp I think maybe that's been accentuated on this site as well with the brew kit. So like the, the wort is slightly cleaner and like there is like a, a lightness of palate to the beers, which we personally love. You know, so that age drinkability, like our beers aren't crazy sweet, so. Well, I really appreciate you taking the punt and, and coming with me on this weird journey of saying, hey, let's brew a spring beer in August. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and I can't wait to, to taste it, which will be the, the next scene in this video. Yeah, from our perspective as well, Johnny, so good to have you down again. I know you came down to the old site and we talked about IPAs when we were first sort of doing our New England style IPAs. So it's always a pleasure to have you down. And Cheers, guys. Cheers, mate. Cheers. I'm drinking with an empty glass up here. <laughs> I'm always amazed in this job visiting all these breweries and seeing kind of how humble everybody is about their success, you know? People kind of think that being a craft brewer is easy or opening a craft brewery is easy, but if you actually own one or you work at one, you can see how hard these people work, how many other breweries there are out there that don't achieve this level of success, and how hard it is to grow and maintain quality, and there's loads of breweries that I could name that have fallen foul of that, and Deus simply haven't, and all kudos to them. Um, and massive, massive gratitude from me as well for brewing this beer with me, taking a chance on a slightly weird concept. Like we said in the video back there, the idea was to try and make something that had the aromas of spring, so floral, piney, maybe rain-soaked pine, um, but also a beer that has a bit of warmth to it. We were kind of thinking like the, the spring sun, that first warmth on your face, hence why it's a dipper, a little bit of red cheeks going on. Um, that would just sort of really sing of spring, even though, you know, we brewed it in August and we released it at the end of September. So let's give it a pour and see what we think of this. You can still buy this beer uh, at lots of different independent bottle shops around the UK, and you can still buy the beer and the book from beermerchants.com in a pack with the other four beers that I brewed. So, I mean, it's not, not the usual day at Ultra Merc, but that is far too hazy for a New England beer. Um, the, the malt recipe is actually, it's 90% pale malt and 10% wheat. So I think the yeast has done um, almost no work in flocculating that. And obviously with the hefty dry hop, um, we, we've kept a lot of that in suspension, which might mean loads and loads of hop aroma. So the first thing I get off of that is loads of grapefruit, loads of grapefruit pith and notes of pine. I wouldn't say rain-soaked pine, but there's pine there. But it's all underpinned by a really, really juicy kind of underlayer, which isn't quite to style. And I think it'll probably come from Daya's house yeast, which they have a sort of a drier, more West Coasty yeast and a really fruity New England one. And I think this drier West Coast yeast has not gone far enough over that side to produce lower esters and really just let those hops shine. So there's definite kind of yeast, yeast profile there. But it is lovely and floral as well. It smells incredibly fresh, which is bang on, bang on for what we were looking for. So it's much lighter than you think it's going to be uh, from the look of that. You're expecting a really pillowy um, soft kind of mouthfeel, but actually like a lot of the day beers and why I wanted to work with them, it's really crisp. Really, really light considering how fluffy it looks. Um, and yeah, wickedly crisp, uh, which is making it at 8% a very, very dangerous drink. Um, the bitterness is there. Uh, I think we ended up, we were aiming for 50. I'd have gone a little bit higher in retrospect, I think. Um, you want it to kind of whack you around the chops and remind you that this is a West Coast, not a New England IPA, but it's definitely elevated well above what most sort of New England dippers in the UK would be. And that's really nice to see as well. In terms of the look, I think that's, you know, lots of people drink with their eyes and that's going to make people think that's not a West Coast IPA. But I think it comes, you know, right in the middle. It's like a mountain IPA, like the one that we brewed, uh, brewed with Wildcard in our homebrew episode a couple of months ago. I think it's, it's right in between those coasts, which is actually, you know, Odell-like, which is where Theo learned to, learned to brew these kind of beers. So it's exactly what I should have expected um, from Dea. Uh, it's a really beautiful, crisp big bald IPA definitely that pine and that floralness really comes through so I'm really happy with that but for me as a west coast purist I wanted more bitterness I wanted more clarity um, but I'm still going to drink my way through that case very very happily indeed. Mm -hmm.